Amen. Are we in the book of Luke chapter 14 this morning? Luke chapter 14. I want to read from verse 25 to verse 33. Please follow along in your Bibles. In my Bible, the subtitle of this paragraph or this section is The Cost of Being a Disciple. The Cost of Being a Disciple. A large crowd was following Jesus. Verse 25. He turned around and said to them, If you want to be my disciple, you must hate everyone else by comparison. Your father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Verse 28, but don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there is enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money. And then everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there's the person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. Or what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down with his counselors to discuss whether his army of 10,000 could defeat the 20,000 soldiers marching against him. And if he can, he will send a delegation to discuss terms of peace while the enemy is still far away. So you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. Amen? You cannot become my disciple without giving up everything that you own. Without giving up everything that you own. Over the past few weeks, we have been exploring this idea of Christ in you. Two Sundays ago, we looked at Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. Last Sunday, we looked at Christ in you, the power and the wisdom of God. Amen. Amen. And this Sunday, we're going to look at this idea. You cannot be my disciple except you give up everything that you own. We're going to look, as we continue in the series this morning, at a topic that is titled Christ in You. A radical you. Amen. amen. Christ in you. Amen. amen. A radical you. Amen. amen. Christ in you. A radical you. I want to start this morning by saying when Jesus walked on the earth. He picked 12 men. We call them disciples. He picked 12 men with whom he spent the majority of his time. In the three years of his ministry, Jesus picked 12 men and he poured himself into them. He poured himself into their lives. And when he was leaving the planet, Jesus tasked these 12 men, equipped with the power of the Holy Spirit, with the work of continuing his mission. Twelve men. Twelve men who were unlearned. Twelve men who were uneducated. He put the responsibility of the survival of his mission and his kingdom in their hands. Now, as we look back on history, we know that these 12 men changed the world. Amen. Amen. 
It's been said, and rightly so, these 12 men turned the world right side up. Amen. 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 In fact, in the book of Acts chapter 4, verse 13, it says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John, these men were so radical and so effective. It says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John, and they realized that they were unschooled and unlearned, excuse me, unschooled, ordinary men, they took note. First it says they were astonished. And then they took note that these men had been with Jesus. That these men had been with Jesus. This morning we're talking about Christ in you. A radical you. To be radical is to be uncompromising in a belief or in an idea. This is from dictionary.com. To be radical is to be completely sold out to something. To be so sold out to something that you seem extreme. That you seem radical. Excuse me, not that you seem, that you are extreme. That you are radical. To be radical is to hold strong convictions about something. Unshakable con convictions. To be so sure that you know that you know that you know that you know. That you are willing to do anything for the cause. That you're willing to give anything for the cause. The Christian faith is a call to discipleship. A Christian is a disciple. You cannot be a Christian if you are not a disciple. Amen. If you are not a disciple, you're not a Christian. The terms Christian and disciple are synonymous. The Christian faith is a call to be a disciple. We are called to be disciples, to be followers of Jesus. In fact, the term Christian is only mentioned in the Bible three times. In the book of Acts chapter 11 verse 26, it says that the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. In Acts chapter 26 verse 28, that's the second reference to the word Christian in Bible. It says, and Agrippa replied to Paul, in a short time you will persuade me to become a Christian. And in the book of 1 Peter 4 verse 16, Peter says, if anyone, but if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not feel ashamed. But in that name, let him glorify God. The word Christian is only mentioned three times in the Bible, but the word disciples is mentioned over 200 times in the New Testament. We are called as Christians to be disciples of our master. We are called as Christians to be followers of Jesus. There are many calls, many references to this call to be a disciple in the Bible. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, I don't know if we can put that on the screen. I want us to read that this morning. We see one such call to be a disciple. Jesus says, he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. And take up his cross daily. And then follow me. We see a progression. Before you follow him, you have to pick up your cross. Before you have any business with following, first pick up your cross. Before you pick up your cross, deny yourself. Deny yourself. Jesus says, anyone who wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and follow me. Pick up their cross. 
Today, it's easy for us to look at the cross and lose the meaning behind what the cross is. We see people wear chains with the cross and we can lose the meaning of what the cross means. In Jesus' day, when you said cross, you're referring to a symbol of torture. A symbol of death. It would be as if Jesus was saying in today's day and age, pick up your electric chair and follow me. Amen. Pick up your cross daily and follow me. It is a high call. It is a high demand. Jesus is saying, put away your own plans and your own desires and turn over your life to me and follow my own plans and my own desires for your life. Amen. Amen. We see also in the book of Mark chapter 10 verse 17 there there's a narration of a story of of a man whom we've studied previously is a rich young ruler and Jesus come, he comes to Jesus what shall I do to inherit eternal life and in verse 21 Jesus says he says Jesus looked at him and loved him and Jesus says in verse 21 go sell everything that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Radical demands. It's a radical demand that Jesus makes. Jesus says it's not enough for you to just believe in me. It's not enough that you just believe that I can save you. Jesus says, give me your life. Give everything and anything that I ask for in service to me. It's a high call, it's a high demand. But we see in several places in scripture, we've referenced some of them. And in our Bible reading today, in the book of Luke chapter 14, as we return to that story, we're going to spend the rest of the time in that story. Jesus begins to break it down to them. Verse 25. And there went great multitudes with him. Let's pause right there. There went great multitudes with him. All the translations say a great crowd. A large number of people went with Jesus. These were not people who did not like Jesus. They were following him. They were positive about him. They were interested in him and his message. But it was a crowd. And they were following him. But it is not enough to follow Jesus. Amen. Amen. It is not enough to be interested in him. To be interested that he exists. Jesus turned to them specifically. And he said, as if he was saying, it's not enough to be interested in me. It's not enough to like my message. But anyone who wants to be my disciple must commit his or her whole life to me. Anyone who wants to be my disciples, who wants to be a disciple, must be willing to bear whatever I ask you to do. Many people were following Jesus. Perhaps some of them thought they were followers of Jesus. When in reality, they were simply casual followers. They were not committed followers. This morning I want to ask you, are you a casual follower of the master? 
Or are you a disciple? If you have given your heart to Jesus, are you a casual follower of Jesus? Or are you a committed follower of Jesus? Listen to me this morning. Don't be content with being in the crowd. Be a disciple. It is not enough to be in the crowd. Stand out for Jesus. Stand out for the master. Make a difference for Jesus. Be a disciple. Amen. Amen. Come on, somebody say, be a disciple. 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 We continue verse 26 and verse 27. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, hate even and hates his own life also. He cannot be my disciple. This is radical stuff, brothers. Hate your family. Hate your wife. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> what is Jesus saying here? Amen. Is Jesus saying I have to hate my wife? If we closely examine what Jesus is saying here, what Jesus is truly saying is, my, your love for me should make all other relationships look like hate. You should love me so much that when people look at you, they will think, wow. In comparison to your love for Jesus, your love for others pales. Your love for your wife pales in comparison to your love for Jesus. Amen. Your love for Arsenal pales in comparison to Jesus. Amen. I'm preaching to myself now because I believe Arsenal have won today. But whether they win or lose, Jesus is Lord. Amen. Amen. There used to be a time when if Arsenal is playing, ah, even if it's on a Sunday, I'm the, I, I must be, I must be supervising. <laughs> Amen. Score the goal, score the goal. Amen. Or oh, Roger Federer. It's been time. How many of you know the finals of the Opens? Yes. At least many of them are on Sunday mornings. And then most time we're, ah, man, it's right there. And, ah, should I go to church? Or should I? I, I'm going. It's not should I go, but should I go out now? I'm, be, I, I'm not be late. Or should I pause Federer? And I must confess, a few times I was, okay, after this point, after this point, after this point, let me just... <laughs> Jesus is saying, your love for me should pale in comparison to your love for anything else. This is heavy stuff, radical. Daddy Gio shared a message that I think really summarizes this. For those who don't know, Daddy Gio is a fun name we give to the leader of Redeemed Christian Church of God, Pastor E. Adiboye. He shared this story and he said that there was a time when he had been committed to share, to preach, to minister. And he got word, either he got word or his mom was sick. He was so sick that they believed that she was about to transition to eternity. She was about to die. And he had a choice to make. Am I going to be by my mother's side in what could potentially be her final moment here on earth? Or am I going to go and serve God and minister to the people of God? And of course, it was not an easy decision for him. I'm sure he must have wrestled with it. But he says he made up his mind and he told his mom, I love you, if I remember the story correctly. But I'm going. And in his heart, 
He was saying, even if I don't see my mom on this side of eternity again, I know that I'm going to see her again. He loved Jesus so much that he was willing to miss the death of his mother. Just so that he could serve the Father. Now thank God the story doesn't end there. But even if it did, he was committed. But he says that his mother didn't die. In fact, I think she lived another several years after that. But how many of you know if you present that story to a rational man? He will say, man, <laughs> this love for Jesus. Looks like you hate your mom. Christ in you. A radical you. Christ in me. A radical me. Christ in me. Must cost me something. Verse 28. For which of you intending to build a tower. Sit it not down first. And counteth the cost. There is a cost to being a follower of Jesus. A faith that costs you nothing is no faith at all. It must cost you something. It must cost me something to follow Jesus. Let us not be like those who consider themselves to be followers of Jesus, even though they are not followers. They look like followers. They have all the bells and the whistles. They may go to church. <coughs> they may believe in Jesus. They may even give to Jesus. But they are not the real deal. If they're not fully committed to him. Let us, be, let us not just be people who think we are following Jesus. This message this morning, by, with this message this morning, I hope to challenge all of us, myself included, to examine ourselves. If we say we are Christian, to examine ourselves, to make sure that we are disciples of the Master. That we're not just casual followers, but that we are disciples of the Master. I need to run this morning because our time is far spent. Just take a look at the lives of the disciples. It says they left everything. Jesus called them. They were fishermen. They left everything. They left certainty for uncertainty. They left everything. They left their fishing boat, some of them. They left their businesses to follow Jesus. Have you thought about it? When we read the book of Acts, we see the apostles giving themselves to prayer, to teaching, to the study of the word. Have you thought about it? What was their livelihood? How did they live? In Acts chapter 2 verse 42, we see them giving up of themselves. In Acts chapter 6 verse 4, they said we shouldn't leave the study of the word. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and, and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Let's look at Acts chapter 6 verse 4. It's the same trend. This is when... There was, a, there was a dispute in the church. And the apostles said, we will not live, we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. They left certainty for uncertainty. They left convenience for inconvenience. Let me ask you this morning, will you serve God only when it is convenient? Will you serve him only when it is convenient to be there? Oh, it's not convenient to me for me to be at that prayer meeting. It's not convenient. You see, it's not convenient for me to be at that vigil. It's not convenient for me to be there. 
I'm tired. Will we serve Him only when it is convenient? When it's convenient to give. Oh Jesus, I will serve you when it's convenient. I will give when it's convenient. We're not to be people who flinch in the face of inconvenience. Amen. Amen. Don't flinch in the face of that bill. Amen. Amen. We will serve him when it is convenient and by his grace we will serve him when it is not convenient. That is his call upon our lives. Lord, I will pray if it's convenient for me. Lord, I will serve when it's convenient for me. We are called to serve Him in every season of life. Whether it be convenient and whether it is not convenient. God calls us to follow Him on His terms. Not on our terms. If we are not careful, we can make ourselves feel good. Oh, this demand is so high. This demand is so big. Jesus did not really mean it this way. And if we do that, then what we are doing is we are creating a Jesus that is convenient for us. That is idolatry. Thou shalt have no other God before me. When we do that, we are creating a God that fits what we want. That is the definition of idolatry. We are molding a God that is convenient for us. And if we do that, we are not true followers of the Master. We are not true followers of the master. I want to share this story as I close. After, after a particularly, probably even during, but also after a particularly challenging season in my life, when God, when, when I had just gone through so much and I was wondering, God, what, what's going on? Why is this happening? Why did this happen? God spoke to me and said these words. And they're so real, and I want to share them with you today. Oh, God said, my goal is not to make you happy. My goal is to make you ready. It is not God's goal to make us happy. My goal is to make you ready for heaven. My goal is to make you ready. And whatever it takes, even if it makes you unhappy. My goal is to get you ready for my kingdom. And as those words hit me, I hit me, I knew it was true. Amen. Amen. I've been in church for a long time, I knew it was true. God does not promise us that we will always be happy, brothers and sisters. God does not promise us that it will always be convenient. God does not always promise us. After all, in Hebrews, it says some of the fathers of faith, they died still hoping. But they did not let go. They said, like the three Hebrew children, we know that you can deliver us, no doubt. But even if you choose not to deliver us, we will not stop following you. We will not bow to your gods. Are there any ones in this room this morning who will say, even if my God, in his sovereignty, even if he chooses not to deliver me, I will still praise him. I will still worship him. I will not be upset at God. I will not be angry at God. I will not be mad at God. I will not give up on God. I will be radical for Him. That is the challenge to us, brothers and sisters. And I am right in the middle of that challenge. Because God has put demands on my life. And God is putting demands on my life. And I said, what? 
And I begin to try to rationalize, okay, God, how about, you know, yeah, 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 but let's start here. Let's start here. Even this week, it happened. And God, just let me be for a few days. And then in a prayer session, somebody raised a prayer point and said, we should be careful not to bring to God our ideas and say, God, bless my idea. Some of you may have heard it. This was on our conference, prayer conference call. And the person said, no. Say, God, what would you have me do? And then I will do that. Don't come to God and say, God, here is what I want to do. Put your stamp of approval on it. No, come to God and say, God, what would you have me do? To be sure, it is a high calling. To be sure, it is a difficult mandate. To be sure, it is a heavy call. But if you and I want to fulfill God's plans for our lives, we must submit to be His disciples. Amen. Amen. We must submit to being His disciples. Listen to me, man of God, woman of God, because that is what we all are. God doesn't need a crowd to reach Bellevue. Just like he didn't need a crowd in the days of the disciples. God just needs a few radical men. He just needs a few radical women. He just needs people who will say, God, I trust you. God, I'm serving you. God, you want me to give up my career? I will do it. Radical. God, you want me to give up? This, I will do it. God, you want me to give up that? I will do it. God is looking for a few good men, a few good women, a few radical people, a few uncompromising men and women who are completely sold out to him and who will follow him on his terms. Will you be such a man this morning? Will you be such a woman this morning? Will you say, God, I, I see this is a high call, but I choose to follow you. I choose to walk with you. I choose to be your disciple. Because anything less, anything less than that, And we will risk missing out what is radical about our faith and replacing it with what is comforting. I pray this morning that that will not be our portion in Jesus' name. Would you rise to your feet today? Would you just rise to your feet? The word of God has come to you as it has come to me. And every time the word of God comes, we have a choice to make. A few weeks ago, we were talking about this man. It was the rich young ruler, actually, interestingly enough. He came to Jesus. But he left the way he came. This morning, I want to beg you. You can come as you are, but don't leave Jesus as you came. Will you be a disciple? Will we follow Jesus wherever he leads? Would you just make that your prayer this morning? If you have that conviction in your heart, pray that today and say, God, help me. Help me to be your disciple. Help me to be your disciple. I'm speaking to Christians this morning. Excuse me, this afternoon. I'm speaking to disciples today. Renew your commitment to God. I will follow 
follow you wherever you lead me not just when it's convenient we live in a busy society we live in busy times don't leave God the leftover the crumbs of your time it was enough for that woman she said yeah even the dogs eat the crumbs from their master's table. But our God is way, way much more deserving than crumbs. He deserves our very best. This morning I pray that you will have that conviction in your heart. Lord, anything is fair game. Would you just pray this morning, Lord, help me. Help me. We may all be called to give up different things, but listen to this. We must give up what he calls us to give up. God may call one person to give up something and another person to give up another thing. We don't come to him and say, God, this is what I want to give up. Father, help me, oh God. Help me, oh God. Help us, oh God. Help us, oh God. To follow you, to follow you, to follow you, to follow you. Not to give you the crumbs and the leftovers. Father, I will follow you. I will follow you. I will follow you, O oh God. Make that your prayer. It's my prayer. Father, help me to follow you. God, when you place demands on my life, when you place demands on my time, when you place demands on my career, when you place demands on my ambition, when you place demands on my family, when you place demands on my money, when you place demands on anything that you have given to me, help me to follow you. Help me to follow you. Help us to follow you. Help us to follow you. In the name of Jesus.